You're listening to Country Music Success Stories featuring Music City mentor J.C. Don Valeris. Now, here's your host, Candy O'Terry. J.C. and I spent a lot of time on Music Row during my latest trip to Nashville. I think I've told you before that she lives in Nashville, but I'm here in Boston. Music Row fascinates me because although there are office buildings, they're not very tall. And the streets are lined with old craftsman-style houses that have been turned into record labels and publishing houses, recording studios, music licensing companies, video production houses, radio networks, and PR firms. Music Row is now a registered historic district in downtown Nashville. And it's safe to say that on these streets, you can hear the heartbeat of country music. So it was fitting for us to sit down with three-time Grammy nominee Jamie O'Neill on Music Row, just a stone's throw away from beautiful Belmont University. We were there in a charming craftsman-style home, now owned by the PR firm that represents her. And the minute we sat down, Jamie was really open and authentic. As we settled into some cozy chairs and couches, the sunlight was streaming in from oversized windows, and you could look out on the tree-lined streets. And I just knew that the vibe was going to give us an interview you would love to listen to. And when it comes to working hard in the entertainment business, here's just a glimpse of what Jamie told us. When I had chicken pox... I went on stage. When I had a cracked rib, I went on stage. And that is the old vaudeville saying, the show must go on. But it's kind of true. I mean, I've gone out there on crutches. Somehow you get through. JC couldn't wait to ask Jamie about how to be discovered in the new Nashville. And you're going to hear her answer to that question in JC's Music City Mentor segment at the end of this episode. I did my research about Jamie's fascinating career path, which began very early in her childhood. You see, she is the daughter of professional musicians Jimmy and Julie Murphy, and she was part of the Murphy family band. At about eight years old, I went on stage for the very first time. My sister and I would watch our parents performing from the side of stage, and we would get very bored. And so we decided if we're going to be on the road, we want to be out on stage as well. So they got us up thinking it would just be a one time only thing. And then we fell in love with it and wanted to keep doing it. What was it about the stage that you fell in love with? The applause was a big factor. It's exciting doing something scary and doing it anyway and feeling like all these people are watching you and then you get the applause and then people are connecting. And it's a whole energy, you know, I think that I felt at a young age and didn't want to do anything else. And you can totally tell a difference of going out and playing for 20 people versus 3,000 people. I think that got me pretty early on. Did you always know that what you wanted to do was be a singer? Did you feel like you had a certain gift, a certain talent? I did, for sure, because I can't remember not singing. So tell me a little bit about your hometown and what life was like in your house, besides the fact that you were touring with the Murphy Family Band. Yeah, well, it's very confusing because I was born in Australia, but I was raised in the States. We didn't have a home till I was about 10 years old and we moved to Las Vegas because my parents were performers and then we were in the act, you know, so we lived in Vegas for a couple of years. We lived in Louisville, Kentucky for a couple of years. Then we lived in Nashville, L.A., and then I moved back to Australia and then I moved back to Nashville and I've been here ever since 1996. You know, that's really hard for a kid, isn't it? I mean, were you always the new kid in class then? Well, I wasn't in class. We had a private tutor that traveled around with us. It was a very strange upbringing looking back at it. I think, wow, that must have been so weird raising your family because when we weren't playing shows, we were at KOA campgrounds living out of our motorhome. Wow, what an incredible So I'm a trailer park kid. We thought it was great, you know? It's like we were always somewhere new. We were always outside. What was the work ethic like then in your family? Because it sounds like that was hard work as performers. It was every day. I mean, we played, sometimes we would play five nights a week. Well, five days, because sometimes we did daytime shows and nighttime shows, and we would play at the fairs. And really anywhere, fairs, festivals, conventions. We played for Mary Kay. We played Amway. You know, I mean, we played all over the place. Tell me a little bit about your songwriting, Jamie. When did you start writing songs? I was probably about 17 the first time. You know, when we spoke to Lori McKenna, she described her songwriting when she was a little girl 
as bad kid poetry, which I thought was so funny. Are you musical in that you were able to actually write the song and write the notes that went along with the song? Tell me how that started for you. Well, I don't play guitar. So I've always been into like drum loops and things, and I would put melodies to a beat and then maybe take a title idea, write down like a page of titles. And I mean, I feel like coming to Nashville, I learned from the best. It's kind of like songwriting 101 when you get to Nashville, you know. Let's go back to the time when you were singing back up for Kylie Minogue. What was yeah. that like? What was that experience that was like for you? That was incredible. That was incredible. Early 20s, touring the world, she was shopping. I spent all my money shopping in London. I mean, it was crazy. If only I could do it over again. Touring at that level, too, to be able to see that. She would play Wembley, 60,000 people, and we would run off stage and we would get on double-decker buses, and we would get to the next town and go to the hotel. And it was just so exciting, you know, when you're 21, 22 years old. It's just, it was a thrill. Well, you know, you've been performing your whole life, but we learn something from everyone we work with. What did you learn from watching Kylie on stage? An extreme work ethic for her because we left Australia and we went to London and we went into rehearsals and we would do like 10 hours a day rehearsing she would be doing 12 hours because she would be doing interviews she would be doing costume changes and she would do choreography so the band would rehearse in one section and she would be doing choreography in another and then she would come over and it was just all day long and even after the show you know she would have friends I mean you two would stop by you know Bono would be there and she would be up, you know, seeing friends and visiting with them after the show. And then she would start all over again at seven in the morning. So I really got to see what it's like to be an artist at that level and how hard they work and that there's not a lot of rest. So that when I got my record deal and I was out doing radio constantly and shooting videos, it was very important for me to have a strong work ethic because I'd seen her and I knew what it took. And I didn't want to be that person that complained when it's all you've ever wanted. You know, it's like, why would you complain about something that 30,000 people wish they were doing as well? Traveling is hard, especially the older you get. I can't tell you how many artists like you have sat beside me and said, touring is not easy. Touring yeah. is hard it is. work. It's hard, yeah. You're signed to Mercury Nashville. You're only 32 years old yeah. when you get signed to that record deal. Tell me a little bit about There Is No Arizona. Tell me the story behind that song. It was actually a line in a Stephen King movie, Dolores Claiborne. Sometimes I feel like things are meant to be. I had written down Sedona, The Painted Desert. I really wanted to write a song called Sedona because it was one of those towns I went to probably in either the late 80s, maybe, or the early 90s. I went there and it was like way different than it is now even. It's way more discovered now. But it just stuck with me. I was like, I either want to have a daughter called Sedona or I want to write a song about it or something. And so I carried that title around for a long time. And then when I got together with Lisa Drew, she said, well, that's weird because I have the title. There is no Arizona written down. And I don't know what it means. And then Shay had the little guitar riff that opened the song. And so it just flowed. You know what I mean? It just was meant to be. Tell me about the first time you ever heard that song on radio. My alarm was set. To go off. And when it went off, that song was playing on 98 right here in Nashville. What did you do? Screamed, woke my husband up, scared him. <laughs> but it was, it was so exciting, you know, and it never gets old. Speaking of your husband, you guys have been married for how many years now? 21 years, but 25 together because we dated for four years before we got married. Tell me a little bit about him. He's a studio engineer. He's a guitar player. He's a fantastic dad. He's a fantastic dog dad. <laughs> he just loves animals, which to me is a really big part of who I am. If I were going out with someone and they said they didn't like dogs, there would not be a second date. That would be it. I'm glad he passed the dog test. He totally passed it. Second single was called When I Think About Angels. Debuts at number 45. It became your second number one song. Tell me the story behind that song. I wrote that with Roxy Dean and Sonny Tillis. And we used to write together all the time. I love them as people and writers. And Roxy and I had met the guys who we ended up going on to marry. And we were talking about how everything reminded us of them. We were very distracted. You know, we would drive down the road and see a restaurant and go, oh, you know, that reminds me. And it would always, we would always start talking about 
these guys we were dating and probably drove other people crazy because we were just so into these boys at the time. <laughs> so many years later, once you've been married for 25 years, it's like, ah, everything changes. Everything evolves. Shiver, your first record goes gold. What does that feel like to have a gold record? And did you have like a gold record party, number one parties? Like what was yes. this whole thing like in your life? That, Take me is, back. that is one of the most fun things is having the number one parties and getting to invite your friends and then having the gold record party was really great. Yes, I, I enjoyed all of that. You have two back-to-back -back number one songs. You're rolling along, your career's going well, but the pressure to perform and deliver mm -hmm. number one songs. How did you handle that pressure, Jamie? Well, it's not easy, you know? I mean, it's one of those things that you write a song and then everything gets compared to it. I'm, so, I'm sure it's like that when you're an actor. You know, you're known for this big, huge role. And then how do you, you know, I mean, Meryl Streep's managed to do it, but very few manage to do a pivotal role or have that one song that comes along in your career that's like you're known for that, like Leanne Womack, you know, I Hope You Dance or Tim McGraw, Live Like You Were Dying. You know, everybody has that one song and you hope that you can keep making songs like that. But sometimes it is a once in a lifetime, you know, sometimes it is one of those songs that just connects with people because it's so different. I got so many letters from girls and women who realized they were in a dead end relationship. So it instantly connected me with women out there, just like somebody's hero connected me with moms everywhere and daughters. A lot of daughters would say, I dance with my mom at my wedding. And that's the song that we chose to dance to. Tell me the story behind that song. That song, I feel like having a child changed me, but Having the feeling of wanting to be the best, wanting to be a hero because your baby looks up to you for everything and wanting to be the best mom I can be, the best person I can be, I guess. And just thinking about my mom and my grandmothers and my stepmom, you know, just everybody who influenced me. I mean, it's just the highest compliment when someone talks about your song being a part at their of their wedding. life. Yeah, part of their life. And it's in a Hallmark card. So every Mother's Day, which is really cool for me that people are sending cards out with my song in it. You have a beautiful daughter. Her name is Aaliyah. She was born in 2003. How did motherhood change you? In, in every way. In Talk every about way. it. It made me stronger. It made me feel like things in the music business didn't matter as much because I was a mom and that and being a mom is everything, which I had no idea. I mean, I didn't even know if I wanted kids. It wasn't like I planned and I knew how I was going to feel. You don't know how you're going to feel. And you can't tell someone else. They have to experience it for themselves. But it's like, I always say, it sounds so dumb to me, but my sister has an 18, 19 month old. And it's like every day is Christmas. You know, when you get up, it's like Christmas again. Like, oh, I get to go see my baby, you know. Especially if they've given you a few hours of sleep. Yes, right? then you're way in a better mood, way more in a better mood. But You know, I, I want to talk a little bit more about your experience growing up in the Murphy family band, which it sounds to me was hard, hard work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess here you are, you're married to someone who knows the business very well as a producer, as a sound engineer, as a guitarist. Did you both make a conscious decision that you were going to give your child as normal of a life as you could? How did that go? I don't know if it was one of those big conscious decisions. I think when you're in this crazy business, you have to do what it takes to get the job done. And us being on the road together meant that our child would come with us. So there were times when she was bolted down the back in her crib, you know, and then she graduated to having her own bunk, you know, and that kind of thing. She loves the bus. She still loves going on the bus. She would rather skip school and go on the bus than stay back home. Let me tell you. There were times, though, when Trying to Find Atlantis came out, for instance, we were on a radio tour and on radio tours, you do a lot of things like shows and performances to get ads at radio. And so we had set up in California driving in like, I think it was a suburban, you know, and I had like three players and my baby and someone to help watch the baby when we were on stage and my dog, cause he had to come along. Well, my dog had just had cancer. So he had just had two surgeries. So he had the cone on and everything. And then 
barreling down the highway, my daughter got a really bad fever. I can remember exactly the parking lot of a 7-Eleven crying and saying, I don't think I can do this. I, I just, I don't know how I'm going to do this with a sick baby and, you know, and trying to find a doctor along the way in the middle of nowhere. Those were the aspects of being an artist that I would look at and go, this is hard. This is really hard because you don't, you rather say no and walk away, but you can't. You know, we all need somebody who believes in us, Jamie. As you look back on your life, has there been somebody who's always been your person who said, you know, Jamie, you can do this, even if it gets hard? Mm -hmm. Well, both my parents are that way. My mom was a dancer and she was very disciplined. And she was always like, the sky's the limit. There's nothing you can't do. My dad, too. They never, ever talked about me doing anything else. You started your own record label in 2012. Mm -hmm. Bold move. Talk a little bit about that. That was difficult, I have to say. I wanted to have a place that female artists could launch from and you, I could mentor. And I have produced a lot of female artists and really enjoyed doing that. One of the first ones I did was Rochelle, Rochelle Lene. I think it's very hard. I mean, I found out, you know, it's, it's really too hard, too expensive to keep a label going. For me, it was. But I really enjoyed it while we were doing it. You look at the 1990s in Nashville and you think about artists like, and I know you, you know these women so well, you think about Sarah Evans, who grew up on the road in a family band just like you. Yeah. How important have relationships been for you with other women in this business? I know you were part of the Girls' Night Out tour and things like that. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I love Sarah, first of all. She's one of my favorite people. And Martina McBride is amazing. And Reba, staying in touch with them and, and feeling like I can ask, you know, what Martina thinks of something or, you know, and ask them to sing on my songs means so much to me, you know, and even Dolly too has been someone that I feel like is very inspirational and as a songwriter and as a woman and just who she is, she's unafraid to say or do whatever she wants. Tina Turner is another one that I think is just so inspirational and look at what she overcame. I've always been inspired by women like that who aren't trying to be you know, the little woman sitting at home. New project, a Christmas album. Yeah. Tell us all about it. You, you light right up when I ask you. Tell us about your Christmas album. Well, I've never done a Christmas album. So to me, just doing something new like this has been really fun. And I love singing the old classics. White Christmas is out this week. And I've had a really good time writing new songs that are original Christmas songs too. Last year, the pandemic, your fourth studio album comes out sometimes duets with Lauren Elena, Martina McBride, Sarah Evans, and your daughter is yes, honest. Yes. What was that like? It was incredible. In the video for Somebody's Hero, she was a little toddler. And now we're singing the song together. So to me, it kind of took the song to a whole other level with a deeper meaning. You know what I mean? And she is an aspiring singer herself. Yes. How do you give your daughter advice and be her mom and her mentor all at the same time. It's funny because there's so many roles that I play. Like if she's doing photos, I'll do hair and makeup, you know, and, and, and buy her clothes because she's so busy at school and everything. And I'll be like, it's fun for me. A couple of standout moments as I'm looking at your career, which has so many standout moments, but I'm thinking about the scene in Bridget Jones' diary and you singing all by myself. Did you go to the theater and go, oh my God, there I am? Yeah, that was a dream come true for me. I got to go to the premiere and meet Renee and Hugh Grant. And it's just one of those things that fell into my lap. I feel so fortunate to be able to do it. And it was it's such a, a tough song to sing. To hear yourself singing a song on a big screen in a movie theater must be pretty cool. Pretty darn cool, yes. And I still get a lot of fans that reach out from the UK because it's on a commercial now for these meerkats that are going to the movies. And so they're like, oh, I saw your commercial again. I got a lot of family over there that are still in England. So I hear that all the time. Another standout moment, singing with Carrie Underwood, Absolutely. the duet. Absolutely. Does he love you? Incredible. I mean, they said... We'd like you to sing this song. We'd like you to sing with Carrie Underwood. She just won American Idol. And I was like, fantastic. Sign me up. I couldn't wait. And that was CMT's 100 Greatest Duets. Did you tape the song in advance? Did you sing it live? Tell me how that worked. We sang it in front of a live audience. And I think we did it like two or three times. 
her voice is just incredible, as you know. Even, even back, back then, then, even back then, this you is know? before Jesus she shakes had, the wheel. Yeah, she absolutely had that star quality and that huge belting voice. I mean, I'm a huge fan of people who can really get up there and wail. You know, you listen to your body of work, and you say to yourself, "That's a pretty well written song," or "That's a pretty good vocal performance." What comes to mind for you? You'll hear actors say, "I don't like to watch myself." I don't sit around and play my own music like maybe some people do. So if it's on the radio, maybe I'll listen like, oh, huh. You know, when I redid Arizona, it did make me go back and say, wow, I sing it quite differently now than I used to or like that lick or what, you know, but I, I hadn't listened to it in a while. I hadn't listened to it until I redid it. Grammy nominations, ACM and Billboard Awards. So much success for you. What are you most proud of? Hopefully people remembering my songs and having a distinct voice. People that connect whatever the message is back to their own lives. Making that connection. Um, Writing songs that are maybe are on a deeper level. Adversity is a great teacher. What's been the hardest part for this journey for you? I would say when bad things happen, having to go on stage and disconnect. Like I just heard Lady Gaga talk about going out there with Tony Bennett and they have this new duets album and obviously they've sung together for years. So you can imagine the friendship that developed and he's got Alzheimer's. So she walks out, he recognizes her. She could have lost it, but she didn't because she knew you can't. And that is one of the hardest things I had to perform after 9-11. I've had to perform. My sister just passed away. I've had to perform after that. My husband's gone through some health things. So, I mean, I think having to perform and just put that hat on of I'm here to do a job. Nobody wants to see me break down. It's not about me and muster through it. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received in your life? Can you pass that on? When I had chicken pox, I went on stage. When I had a cracked rib, I went on stage. And that is the old vaudeville saying, the show must go on. But it's kind of true. I mean, I've gone out there on crutches. Somehow you get through, you know. Final question. Fill in the blank. The key to my success in country music has been what? Staying true to who you are and being unique. Trying to find out what makes you different from everybody else. Jamie O'Neill, I want to say thank you so much for being our guest today on Country Music Success Stories. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm J.C. Don Valeris, your Music City mentor. And let me tell you, I was beyond excited to have the opportunity to talk with Jamie O'Neill. When I was 17 years old, my best friend Erica and I left school early and drove from Chelmsford, Massachusetts, all the way down to Hartford, Connecticut, just to see Jamie perform on the Girls' Night Out tour. I remember it so vividly because watching artists like Jamie solidified my desire to pursue music as my own career. When I was growing up listening to artists like Jamie, I always wished I had the opportunity to sit down and ask for their advice and guidance. Who ever imagined that I'd end up getting to actually do this? Jamie was gracious enough to share her words of wisdom with me, and I am so happy to be able to share all of that with you. Before we got started today, we were talking about the fact that there is really no formula to making it in country music. Mm -hmm. But is there something you wish you knew about the country music industry before you got started? I would just probably compare that question to when I meet young female artists and they always are singing covers. One of the things that I was told and I think is very important is to try to write songs yourself because you're not going to get people's a drawer songs here in Nashville. They're not going to play you their best stuff. You're going to get the stuff that's been laying around for years or maybe, you know, not sing something that's true to you. You'll sing it because you think, Oh, that's, that's a pretty good song, but does it really represent who you are? Because if you can write a song and come up with, you know, just a, even a few lines of this is who I am. Cause I want, people out there who don't know me to know more about me. So I want to write it down. If you can hum a melody and put those lines to a melody, then you're, then you're on your way to writing a song, you know, and even if you finish it with someone else, you're just way better off than singing covers. And you, and you walk into any bar here in Nashville, anywhere, 
And most of these females are all singing the same songs. So it doesn't make them stand out. They're not going to get discovered and signed by being that kind of performer. Like Jamie said, a lot of artists might think that singing cover songs and honky-tonks on Broadway might lead to them getting discovered. But the truth is, that model of finding success is pretty outdated at this point. And if you've ever been to Nashville, then you know the level of talent is at the highest degree of excellence. And for every talented vocalist singing on Broadway, there is another one at the next bar over. So if this model of getting discovered is becoming antiquated, how does an artist actually get noticed? Here are three different ways to get quote unquote discovered in the new Nashville. Number one, write music with lots and lots and lots of writers. Chances are if you begin writing enough, it will lead to you getting a cut on another artist's album. This is one of the best ways to draw attention to what you are doing. The more you write, the more opportunities you'll have to demo your work. Then you'll be able to pitch it to other artists and get cuts and have those artists perform your music. It will also often lead to you performing songs during writer's rounds and shows of your own, which are more likely to attract industry heavyweights than a show performing songs with a cover band. Next, network. This sounds like such a big undertaking, but as soon as you get to Nashville, you will realize how small the town actually is. And that is why it's so important that you are very clear on who you are and what you do from the get-go. After living here for a while, you'll come to see how opportunities are handed out. It's almost always from the recommendation of someone else. Here's an example. If Carrie Underwood's band is in need of a guitar player, chances are the other players are going to recommend someone, a friend or someone they've worked with in the past. If a hit writer is looking for a demo singer, they will often pull a singer that they already know to lead down the vocal. If a label is looking to sign a new artist, they're going to pull from within their circle of artists that they have been watching and working with and getting to know. It's all connected, so the more people you know, the bigger your opportunities will become. Finally, be really good at what you do, including branding and marketing yourself. More artists are getting discovered on social media and on YouTube than ever before. With that said, lots of them are just copying what others are doing. So if you have your own songs, your own style, and your own voice, chances are you will have a better opportunity to stand out than the ones just going online singing somebody else's songs. Whatever you do to make yourself noticeable in Nashville, make sure you remain true to who you are always. Nashville can see right through any artist pretending to be something they are not. And more often than not, your true inner voice is what will make you stand out the most. More wisdom you can use from Music City mentor, J.C. Don Valeris, inspired by three-time Grammy nominee singer-songwriter, Jamie O'Neill. If you liked country music success stories, check out our website, give our podcast a follow, and leave a review. Follow us on social at Country Music Success Stories. We've got more legends to meet and stories to tell. Oh, by the way, we're on TikTok now. Just look up Candy and JC. This is Candy O'Terry saying thank you for listening to Country Music Success Stories, where the stars welcome us into their homes and tell us how they made it in Nashville. 